a fitting topic once again. We have a special speaker this morning. It is Sister Nglobu. We are going to be blessed because God has laid a message on her heart. So I'd like to thank you, Sister Nglobu, for making yourself available today. God will use you, I have no doubt. And please do um, go ahead and speak to us what God has prepared. God bless you and thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sister Belinda. Uh, good morning, beloved of my father. On this beautiful day, I would like to greet you all in the wonderful name, the precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if you were to ask me how I feel this morning, I would say I'm feeling a sense of relief and uh, I am I'm glad actually. I am glad that uh, this is my last uh, message in the group and uh, I am relieved. Uh, it has not been an easy month uh, for me and my family as well, but God has been good. He has been good, but I'm glad that I'm going to exit. You know, uh, my profession uh, requires that I be authentic about my feelings. I cannot explain why I feel relief right now, but I do feel relief, but I am thankful to God for the privilege that he has given me. And I'm thankful to the organizers who allowed me this opportunity to also just uh, contribute towards the building of God's kingdom. We are looking at our last message today and uh, it is entitled, Do It Again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. And I am reading from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, uh, 18 to 20, and also Acts chapter 1, 4 to 8. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Acts chapter one, uh, verse four, five and eight. And being assembled together with them, commanded he them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. John truly baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Uh, verse eight, but he shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And he shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, here is a word which is living and powerful, sharper than any double-edged sword, and your word is you. What a privilege that you can wake up this morning and fall into the everlasting arms and receive the reassurance that we are in good hands. We just want to pray right now, Holy Spirit, that once again, you may terminate with us, that you may bless us with your presence, that you may send us a revival and that we may hear you speaking to us and that you may rebuke, you may correct, you may love, you may restore, you may repair, you may comfort so that all your glory can be seen in us. Oh dear Jesus, how I pray that you would create a clean heart within me so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my soul may be pleasing unto you. This is our humble prayer in your mighty name, oh blessed Jesus, amen. So here is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And it is just before he ascends to be with his father, who is our father. And he gives the disciples what you call the greatest commission. And he says, all power has been given unto me. All power has been given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the father and the son and the Holy Ghost. And he says, and, and I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. And then just before he ascends, you, it's almost like he now changes the message a bit. He initially said, I want you to go and make disciples. But then he gives them a second message that is as important as the first one. 
He says, but I want you to tarry first in Jerusalem until we have received the power from on high. Yes, I want you to go. But before you go, I want you to stay. I want you to sit. I want you to, to receive first the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why he is saying this is because he knows them. He has spent just over three years with them. He knows impulsive, impetuous, cowardly Peter. He knows ambitious, self-centered John. He knows faithless, doubting Thomas, which is why he knows that in this present condition, they are not ready to go and do nothing. I mean, you can imagine Peter, who still got his boots shaken when a girl was saying to him, I know you, you were with him. You were with him, you were with this man of Galilee. So he knows that in their current state, they are not able to do nothing. They cannot do anything. They can be of no effect, no impact upon the world. But he knows that with the Holy Spirit upon them, you know, and he knows the enormous task ahead of them, ahead of them. He knows it is not going to be easy, but and he knows that it's going to require supernatural, substantial power. And he knows that it's not going to be might, nor by power, but it's going to be by the spirit of God. Fortunately, he knows that this power is available, which is why in another place you hear him saying, I'm going to send another helper. It is good that I go, because unless I go, the advocate, the comforter, the helper will not come. He knows that they need this Holy Spirit. So he commands them to wait in Jerusalem till they receive that power. And true to his promise, they tarried and they waited and they prayed together in unity, eating, doing things together. They stayed and stayed and stayed. And then one day they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and it fell upon them. And each and everyone received according to what the Lord wanted to give them. And true to his promise, indeed, they began to set the whole place on fire, starting in Jerusalem, then in Judea, and then in Samaria, and then into the ends of the earth. And here you are, you and I. And all because those men listened and hearkened to the word of God, when he says, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you have received the power from on high. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, we stand on shoulders of giants in this gospel. And we have taken the patent from people who knew that they needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit first before they could attempt to do anything. Because the Holy Spirit was going to give them those beautiful gifts, those beautiful uh, skills, those beautiful talents, those beautiful abilities that would make them to go. And we today, we can, we can expect no less. We, we can... We, we should, we should stop thinking there is a different way that God is going to do it. We need a revival. We need to make it, we need to receive the Holy Spirit before we can go and think we're going to make a difference. Because the Holy Spirit, Ellen White says in another passage, if we were filled with the Holy Spirit, where today we see only one conversion, there would be 20. And where today we see only 20 people interested in the gospel, there would be 2,000. If only we could receive of the Holy Spirit. She says in the book, Selected Messages, book one, page 121, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first word. There must be an earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. The spirit is willing, God is willing to give us this gift. This promise gift is available to us, but you are unprepared to receive it. And listen to what she says, our heavenly father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to those who ask him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But the problem, no one is asking, no one is pleading, no one is beseeching the Lord. No one is waking up every morning to say, oh Lord, fill me now, fill me now, come or oh, come and fill me now. Even our prayers are consumed by I, me and myself, do this for me, do that for me, go here, go there, elevate this, elevate that. Everything is about us. Nothing about receiving the power so that we can fulfill the commission so that this world can come to an end and we can go home. You know, one author has said, the greatest sin of the Old Testament believers was their, was their indifference to God the Father. The greatest sin of the New Testament believers was their indifference to God the Son. And the greatest sin of the present day believers 
is our indifference to God, the Holy Spirit. He is what someone has called the stepchild of religion. You know, confirming this, William Tozer writes, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. Lord have mercy. He says, even if the Holy Spirit would be removed from us today, 95% of what we're doing would go on because we're going on, we're marching on, regardless of whether the Spirit is with us or not. We are so oriented on what we're doing that we don't know that it is the Holy Spirit who's the engine who should be driving whatever it is that we're doing. But William Tozer goes on to say, however, if the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. I mean, here we are, leaders, pastors, uh, elders, deaconesses, age and coordinators, all of us leaders in our own families. And we go ahead. Sometimes I can imagine the Holy Spirit shouting, wait for me, wait for me. Can I also get in a word here? We are so indifferent to how devoid we are of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And it broke me so much when I read, most men play at religion as they play at games. And of course, this would include women too. Religion itself being of all the games, the one most universally played. You think as soccer and football are universal, you think cricket is universal, wait until you see how many people play at this game that is called religion. You know, saints, tackling the issue of abuse and violence is a mammoth task. You know, at times I have even observed, I've even observed to myself that, you know what, maybe it is just better to mention it, tick it off your list and, that, and then pass on to other issues. And, and sometimes I'm tempted to think God doesn't really expect us to do anything about it. It's almost like to me, it will be resolved when Jesus comes. But, but then I think about the innocent boys and girls who get molested. I mean, 93% of those molestations happen by people who know them, teachers, fathers, you know, people who, who are close to them. And, and then you, you, you think about a man or the young man who kills and chops his girlfriend. And you think about the family right now in Matatien. You think about that family who are going to receive the body of their daughter who was sent to university. They are going to receive the, the body in peace and pieces. And I wonder, couldn't something have been done to prevent these atrocities? And then we think about the young man who throws his girlfriend out of the moving car, about the one who throws a seat on her face. You think about the women who kill and order their husband to be killed because they are catching them and they want money. And of course, if you live in South Africa, you will know that these reports are our daily bread. You know, if you look at our gender-based violence and, uh, and violence and femicide deaths, it just chokes you. We are living in a country where aggressive crimes are too high for a country not involved in war. We are known as the rape capital of the world. In fact, if you look at your stats in Gauteng, just between the 1st of April, and 30th of June, the, and in average, 108 women and girls were raped every single day. I'm talking about between April and June, 108. And I don't know, I don't know if you have any idea how intrusive and invasive rape is. And to think we just woke up and more than a thousand women got raped this night in South Africa. And you, you, you say nothing about boys. We are saying nothing about boys. And yet we know that according to states, so many young boys get molested before they become 17. And then you think about femicide uh, stats here in South Africa. We are five times the global average. We think about substance abuse. More than 15% of South Africans are dealing with a substance abuse disorder of one type or another. We think about suicide stats. 23 people came that killed themselves on average in South Africa, and 18 of those are men. And these are not just numbers, dearly beloved. We're talking people. We're talking women. We're talking girls. We're talking boys. We're talking fathers. We're talking sons. We're talking people who were born to, to to, to make an impact in somebody's life. We are a sick nation, but you know what? These abusers and molesters, they don't just live among us. Sometimes they are us.
And Jeremiah 29 verse 7 says, you need to seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof, you shall have peace. Beloved, this casual nonchalant way of dealing with the issue of abuse and violence, if you are a South African, it's not Iowa at all. It is not on at all. We have war here. And yet so many of us are just so comfortable. Do you want to wait until it happens to your own daughter or your own grandchild? Do you want to wait until something happens to yours and it is your daughter who is brought in pieces? When are you going to get up and see that it is not business usual? When are you going to step out of this mentality of complacency and being comfortable? And these are God's children. And do you know what God says about this matter? If you read the Desire of Ages, page 825, Ellen White says, heaven stands indignant at the neglect shown to the souls of men. <clears throat> would we know how Christ regards it? How would a father and a mother feel? Did they know that their child, lost in the cold and the snow, had been passed by and left to perish? by those who might have saved it, would they not be terribly grieved, widely indignant? Would they not denounce those murderers with wrath, hot as their tears, intense as their love? The sufferings of every man are the sufferings of God's child. And those who reach out no helping hand to their perishing fellow beings provoke God's righteous anger. The murderers are not just those who matter. They are those of us who see it and do nothing to help those who are suffering. The sufferings of every child are the suffering of God's child. And you will not hold us guiltless if you just look on and do nothing. Desire of Ages, page 823. Christ feels the woe of every sufferer. When evil, spe when evil spirits rend a human frame, Christ feels the curse. When fever is burning up the life current, he feels the agony. Gender-based violence is a monster too big for any of us. And it will take more than a program or two. It needs commitment to prayer. It needs commitment to praying and fasting. Commitment to praying for social reform. It needs advocacy. Men and women praying and working together. Churches standing up to be counted. Leaders putting it on their agenda monthly. Leaders making sure that their churches are safe places, their, their families are safe places. Leaders waking up from their slumber and knowing that this is something that God is serious about. And, 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 and you know what? We need to hold one another to account. We need to act, to live, to say yes, to be the change we dream of every day of the year until we can be the change, see the change, live the change so others may simply live so that children can play in the park without fear, so that women can go dancing without trembling and fear that they are going to be molested. But more than that, we need God's intervention. More than that, we need God's intervention. You know, this is not by might nor by power. It is by the spirit. And Christ has said, you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit, and it has happened before. You're not the only people who have lived in countries where there was so much immorality. You are not the only country. If you think about John Knox, who lived around the 1500s, he prayed for Scotland every day for hours. He would pray, give me Scotland or I die. Give me Scotland or I die. Give me Scotland or I, or I die. You know, God had. And for years, Scotland was known as one of the most civilized societies in the world. What about Evan Roberts? A young man who started praying when he was 15 for the Holy Spirit. And around 25, he was in prayer meeting with a group of friends. And these are men I'm talking about because I've got men who think just because it's not happening to them, then it does not matter. These are the young men I'm talking about. And the 25, the Holy Spirit fell in that prayer meeting. And then they turned Wales upside down. You know, you know what it is that within a couple of months, Wales was a changed nation. Crime was reduced to almost nothing. In days where cases would have been 700, they were reduced to two. Policemen and magistrates had no work. Some of the courts needed to be closed. Taverns were empty. 
converted to prayer rooms. Even stallions struggled to obey their masters because the masters had accepted Jesus and they no longer saw. And it began with people who had the burden about their perishing nation. And of course, they've got men like John Wesley who prayed for England to the point where in the place where he would kneel, there were knee holes, there were holes on his carpet as he would pray for England. And one day, when a young man, Bill Graham, was on tour with Professor Ed Orr, and they came into this room, into this museum that belongs to the Methodists, and then they looked at the bedroom where John Wesley used to sleep, and they saw these four holes, these holes next to the bed. And one young man asked, what are these holes for? And he was told, it is believed that this is where John Wesley would kneel hour after hour as he prayed for God to bring reform to England. And when they left to go to the bus, the professor noticed that one young man was not in the bus. And he came back to the room, found the man on his knees, rocking himself and praying, do it again, Lord, do it again, Lord. Oh Lord, do it again. Oh Lord, do it again. And the Lord did it again. The Lord did it again, Billy Graham, the greatest authority ever on revival, preached to 185 countries, brought to Christ 215 million people in a ministry spanning over 60 years. If you count the TV program, the radio, the, the books he wrote, he has brought to Christ more than 2.2 billion people. And it all started with a prayer do it again, Lord, do it again, Lord. Brothers and sisters, we have spent just four sessions together. And in this session, some of us have had the Emma's experience and we go away feeling like did not our hearts burn when the Lord was speaking to us? Were not our hearts moved with the Holy Spirit? But the question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to go back to our corners and wait for next year, August again? Are we going back to our comfort zone? Or are we going to raise our hands and say, here am I, oh Lord, say, uh, send me. Are you going to say, if you could use anything, God, you can use me. Some of us here are church leaders and community leaders. We are business people. We are policy makers. We sit in boards and high committees. We have skills. We have got access to the government. We work in social development offices. We are professionals. We have got so much. We have got money. We know people who know people. We are influential in our areas of control. But you have never lifted a hand, a finger to help address the issues of social injustice in our country. We have got church, churches, rich churches that exist among communities that stink with poverty and unemployment, with substance abuse. We have got streets that are filled with amapara, youth wandering aimlessly, boys wearing reds, kicking plastic balls, uh, plastic for soccer balls, pregnant women carrying heavy loads. And every day we pass them by driving in our fancy cars as we go to church on Sabbath. Oh, my Lord, may you have mercy upon us. You know, you know what Christ says to Ellen White in the book, Minister of Healing, page 105? He says, by all that has given us advantage over another, be it education and refinement, refinement, be it nobility of character, Christian training, religious experience, we are in debt to, to those less favored. And so far as lies in our power, we are to minister unto them. If we are strong, we are to stay up the hands of the weak. The sufferings of every child are the sufferings of God's child. And it is my humble prayer that God will give me and he'll give you no sleep, no rest, no peace until you have done what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And so, dear Jesus, we come to you once again, and we are so thankful that you will not allow us to perish, that you will speak to us even today. We are so thankful for your word. Here we are, Heavenly Father. Here I am, so I'm with of the cross. I prostrate myself, God. I should have done more. I, I'm doing nothing, dear. I'm doing nothing. If I look at what is happening, and I look at how much time I spend on my own businesses, I am not doing much for you, Christ, and yet you loved me, and you gave me your own son to die for me. Here I am, here are your daughters, here are your brothers and sisters. We are all saying, do it again, Lord, do it again, Lord, do it again, Lord, unto your glory and yours alone. Amen.